Hi there, welcome to Leading Lights. My name is Greg Donaldson. Today we're looking at the topic of first fruits in the Bible. It was a massive topic in the Old Testament. It dominated the way of life for Israelites. And sadly, we've lost it, but it's a key to a blessing in our lives. You're going to be helped and blessed and propelled forward in Christ today. God bless you as you watch this. We're talking about a sermon series called First. The way you handle things at the beginning, the first steps you take, the first things you do, if you dedicate something to God at the first, even though we are f failed and weak and, and, and broken humans, if I dedicate something to God at the first, the whole thing can be blessed. It's an amazing principle. In Romans chapter 11, it says, for if the first fruits is holy, the whole lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. God has set up a system where he says, if you get the first thing right and you dedicate it to me, I'll bless the whole thing. And we want to talk about this today, but I want to start off before I get to that by talking about um, a principle that Jesus spoke about so much in his life. He spoke about this word called kingdom. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Jesus again and again and again said the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Seek first the kingdom of God. Pray your kingdom come, your will be done. He talked about the kingdom and he also talked about an opposing kingdom. In Matthew 12, 26, he talked about Satan has a kingdom and he, he gave the idea that he was a king bringing in a kingdom and trying to depose another king's kingdom. And so there's all these humans going around the world just living life normally. They're going about their business, they're marrying, they're doing business, they're, they're just having life. And Jesus was saying, there's kingdoms involved. You don't realize it. You're just busy like little ants running around on the floor. But there's a bigger picture. There's two big kingdoms. And he said, there's the kingdom of God, which is eternal, it's forever. And he said, I am bringing you and showing you what the kingdom of God is like. There's healing, there's joy, there's forgiveness, there's peace, there's provision, all these wonderful things. And he said, the kingdom of Satan, you might not realize it, but he is the ruler of this world, Jesus said in John chapter 12. And he is trying to, to cajole all his people subjects and to do bad things and he said open your eyes look around you people there's two kingdoms and in Matthew chapter 6 he talks about this a lot and I'm going to pick out a few verses from Matthew chapter 6 because the famous verse at the end of Matthew 6 he said seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you but before he said that, there's a whole list of things that he said that will help us understand this. And it's such an important thing because he said if we get this first block right, if I seek first the kingdom, then a whole lot of other things will fall into place and be taken care of. But my prayer is that as we go into this year, but also into every area of our lives, if we're starting a new job, a new relationship, a new house, a new country. As we go and we'll learn this principle of seeking first, getting the first thing right and watching how God then blesses everything else. So he started off uh, in Matthew 6, he was saying the Lord's Prayer and he said, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said that we are, even though we're in this earthly kingdom, it's a bit like we're secret agents from another land. We're living in this land, but we're trying to bring in the kingdom from another land, from heaven. We're trying to bring it here into this land. We're trying to change the culture. We're trying to change the way people do things. We're trying to bring the rule and reign of another king into this kingdom. But then, for pretty much the rest of the chapter, he starts talking about work and money. And so most of Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about the kingdom, but he just keeps talking about money and, and material things. 
Let me read you some of the things he said. I mean, they really are quite extraordinary. So he said, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, and your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. So seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. He talked about money and material things a lot in this chapter. And so my message is very simple. I hope you get this. There are two kingdoms and money and the way that we handle material things gives us a, an insight into which kingdom we're building, but is also a way for us to jump out of the wrong kingdom and start building the right kingdom. Money and material things are important. Now, I know that in church, people say, don't talk to me about money. Christianity and religion is not supposed to be about material things. Don't, don't, don't talk to me about money. My, my, my religion is very personal. Don't, don't interfere with my money. But Jesus spoke about money a lot. And he said that actually where your treasure is, your heart is. And so we need to look at this thing. He was saying there are two kingdoms. Which one are you building? But then he said, look at money and the way that you handle it. And it will help you understand which kingdom you're building. So let's start with little bits of money. Clothing, food, and drink. He said, why do you worry about what shall I eat, what shall I drink, what shall I wear? The Gentiles, the pagans, those who are not in God's kingdom are running around panicking and worrying about these things. He said, do not worry, seek first the kingdom of God. So the first layer of this is I need to ask you, are you worrying and panicking about little things, financial things? Well, are you or aren't you? It's not a tricky question. Do you find you're worried? Do you find you're stressed? Oh, my. how am I going to do this? What are we going to do? Am I going to pay the bill? Am I going to do this? He said, if you're there, the, the chances are that you're looking at this world's kingdom. You're not looking at the kingdom of heaven because in the kingdom of heaven, there's a king who supplies your needs. So that's the basic needs level. The second level is when you've accumulated quite a bit of money and now you're quite wealthy. And he said this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So on the basic level, if we are very uh, short on money and things, worry is a sign that we are going towards the wrong kingdom. We're worried about the things of this world. We're trying to build this world. But once you've got a little bit more, he says your heart is drawn to where your treasure is. And he said, if you are laying up your treasure and your heart affection here on earth, you're not building the kingdom of God. I have advised and been involved with helping people who have extraordinary wealth and I've seen this principle in action where actually they gets to a stage where they have so much money that they don't own their money their money owns them and their whole life is worried about their money and their heart is where their money is and he says it's a temporary thing moth and rust and thieves 
destroy your wealth here on earth. It, that's the reason we're so worried, because we accumulate, we accumulate, we accumulate. I'm no longer worried about what, what will I eat and drink. Now I've got so much, but now I'm thinking, will somebody steal it? Can I trust this person? Do they really have my best interests? Uh, is this person being my friend to get my money? And suddenly my heart has moved and I'm just concerned about worldly things. And he says, move your heart out of there. Lay up treasures in heaven instead. The way to break the power of that, that evil, greedy grip is to give. Give to the kingdom of God. Lay up treasure in heaven, he says. So the first level was basic needs. Remember, he's talking about which kingdom are you building? He says, if you're worried about basic needs, no, no, you're not building the kingdom. Second level, if your heart is concerned because you've got a large amount of treasure, you're not, you're not building the right kingdom. You're building a temporary kingdom that can be destroyed. And then the third one is for people who go beyond extraordinary wealth. I don't know if there's anyone in this level. There's probably a few. But he said, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He said, let's take this to its logical conclusion. Let's say you could accumulate so much wealth that you you never even had to worry about who, who to trust and would moth and rust destroy. You were so wealthy, you'd gained so much that you were impervious to circumstances. He said, what value would it be if you gained the whole world but lost your soul? Because this is temporary. This world is passing away, but eternity is forever. He said, think about which kingdom you're building. So I need to ask you, and I'm asking myself, friends, you and I are like little ants running around on an anthill, busy with our lives, and Jesus says, look up and think about which kingdom you are building. Every day, in everything you do, every action, every decision, every motivation, every thought, you are either building an eternal kingdom that has a king in heaven that is full of all the goodness of God, or you are building an earthly kingdom where moth rust destroy and which will pass away. But then he said something beautiful. He said, you can move your allegiance. You can move your heart from the one to the other by seeking first the kingdom. You can say at the first of every month, at the first of every day, at the first of every week, at the first of every year, at the first of every time I get income, the first opportunity, I will put my heart in God's hands, I will build His kingdom, and it switches my allegiance, and I find that I'm building the kingdom of God. And that's why at the end of this long passage about the kingdoms and the money, Jesus concludes it by saying, Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these other things will be added to you. It's an extraordinary statement. What he's saying is this. If you seek the world's kingdom, it may be attractive for a while and it does have an allure and the whole of peer pressure, the whole world's going that way, so you feel, yes, I'm right to be accumulating, accumulating, worrying about money, and yes, I'm right. But he said, moth and rust destroy, and it's temporary, and it will not lead to happiness in the end. Even if you gain the whole world, your soul would still be unhappy and unsafe. Or you can seek God's kingdom where there is a real king, the king of the universe, and he said, if you do this, I'll give you all of this as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you as well. But the thing is, your heart is not with these things, so he's able to add it to you. Because it's not got a grip on your heart. It's an amazing, amazing truth that Jesus taught. And so now I want to talk about this idea of first fruits. Because right from the beginning of the Bible all the way through, there is this concept called first fruits, 
And it only really makes sense when you understand Jesus' teaching about the two kingdoms and seeking first his kingdom. Now I understand why right from the start. So Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel are two brothers and they bring an offering to the Lord. Cain brings some of the produce of his land, but it's not the best and it's not the first. It's just, oh, well, there's a few carrots and some cabbages. Here you go, Lord. But it says Abel brought the first of his flock and gave it to the Lord. And God was pleased with Abel's offering. And then it moves on and we see throughout the pages of the Old Testament, Abraham, he, he wins a mighty victory for God and he finds somebody who serves God and he says, I'm giving you 10% of everything that I've won here to show that it's God's first. The very first thing I'm doing, I'm giving God 10%. I'm, I'm setting the first block in place so that everything else runs the right way. Jacob, his grandson, does the same thing. He's, he's running away from God. He's running away from his brother. He's scared. He's worried. God appears to him in a dream at a place called Bethel. He says, this is the very gateway of heaven. And he sees God and God talks to him and he says, from now on, 10% of everything I get, I will give to God first. And then God institutes the law at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and God says of every single thing you get in, the best and the first 10% you give to me. And we say, why is God saying that? He's saying that because he knows what our hearts are like. And he says, if you get going on the right path at the start, you will be building my kingdom. You'll be worried about my things, seeking first the kingdom and my righteousness. And all these other things will be falling into place. I'll read you a couple of the verses. Proverbs 3. Honor the Lord with your possessions with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine honor the lord with the first fruits of all your increase what does that mean it means every time i get an increase in my life of anything the very first goes to the lord because I'm saying, God, I'm putting my heart in the right place at the start. And then your vats and your barns start to overflow. The problem is, often we focus on the overflowing vats and barns. We say, I want the overflow. And we are, it's, it's like we're trying to build our own little kingdom, the worldly kingdom, but we're trying to use God to do it. He says, no, no, it doesn't work that way. You put your heart with my kingdom, and then all these other things will be added to you as well. There are many verses in the Old Testament. I, I don't have time to go through all of them. But just to say that in the Old Testament, I, I need to just make this point clear. Have you ever wondered about the difference between the Old Testament law and the New Testament way of relating to God? It's a big subject, and I, I don't have time to go to, into it in too much detail, but let me just summarize it like this. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came and restored relationship between man and God, men's spirits within them were dead. And so in order to get people to behave correctly, God had to tell them what to do on a, a list of rules and regulations. And that's called the law. And so he said, you must give 10% of everything. And it was an external rule and they made whatever humans always do with rules. They, they kind of got all weird about it and they, they got all proud and I'm better than you and I can keep the rules. And they never really kept the rules properly. But then Jesus came and, and Jeremiah 31 says, I will put my laws in their hearts and on their minds. I will move them to want to do my will. And so after Jesus, we have his law inside of us. And as a result, in the Old Testament, people were told to give 10% and they did begrudgingly. But in the New Testament, people give much more. Zacchaeus, the rich tax collector, sees Jesus. Jesus forgives his sins. He says, Lord, I give half of all of I possess away. 
That's more than 10%. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9, Paul is boasting about the Macedonian Christians. And he says they pleaded with us to be able to give. Out of their extreme poverty and joy, it welled up in generosity. They, they were like, it's the opposite of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is begrudgingly. In the New Testament, it's out of joy. Let me just read you a, a couple of verses. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2 talking about the Macedonians he said in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality and verse 4 he says they were imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift it's the difference between being told to do something and wanting to do it and then in the next chapter, chapter 9, he says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Grudgingly or of necessity is the Old Testament way of giving. Grudgingly means I'm not very happy of it, about it. Necessity means somebody is pulling on me to get money out of me. That's the Old Testament. Grudgingly and of necessity. But the New Testament is as we purpose in our heart and cheerfully. It's the opposite of grudgingly and of necessity. It's not because someone's begging me. I've decided because God has put it in my heart. And it's not grudgingly like, oh, here we go. It's cheerfully because I know that I'm building God's kingdom. And so all the laws in the Old Testament were written down and people tried to obey them but never did. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit fire within us enables us to go way beyond what they could do in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, instead of just um, outward trying to keep the rules, he said, now it comes from within. Instead of just doing all the outward things, but inside you're not really with God. He says, now, because my spirit's in you, you can obey the rules, but properly from within you with a, with a passion and a zeal. So what am I saying today? Jesus challenged us. He said, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all of these other things will be added. But we don't do it because we want to get all the other things. We do it because we want to be building our lives into God's kingdom instead of into a worldly kingdom that will pass away. And if I decide if I purpose in my heart at the start of every month or every time I get any increase, I say, Lord, the first, the first fruits is yours. A, it sets my heart on the right tra trajectory, but B, the whole lump is blessed. He said, if the first fruits is holy, the whole batch is holy. If the roots are holy, the whole tree is holy. If I give God the first, he says, now I can pour my blessing into every part of your life because you've started in the right direction. Now I want to be honest with you and say that this is not a decision or a battle that you make once only in your life. Every single time you get income, every time you get increase in your life, the same test rises up in your heart, which kingdom will I go with? Will I go with worry? Will I go with building up treasure and my heart being here on earth and moth and rust can destroy? Will I go with earthly pleasures and what the world says? Or will I go with God's kingdom? And it happens every single time you get increased. You might be a tither, but every month you still have to exercise your faith again to say, this month we're giving. And because that verse that I've read to you in 2 Corinthians 9 says, we purpose in our heart and we do it cheerfully. The way that I do it and I suggest to many people to do it is you, you decide the very first <laughs> The very, very first goes to the Lord. Before I pay my rent, before I pay my tax, before I pay anything, boom, that's the Lord's. I seek first the kingdom and then I move with him. 
So I'm going to ask you, you might say I'm very uncomfortable, Greg, that you're talking about money. Friends, I have to talk about money because Jesus talked about money. He said the kingdom of God is more important than the kingdom of this world. He said you can set your heart on the right trajectory by seeking first my kingdom. And, and in 2 Corinthians 9 it says purpose in your heart and do it cheerfully. I'm challenging you to change. I'm challenging you to say, Lord, from now on, every time I get any income, I'm going to put you first. I'm going to set it aside. Before I have time to be worried and let my brain start worrying about all the different things the world says, I'm going to put your kingdom first. And he says, all these things will be added to you as well. Jesus said that two or three people gathered in his name can be a church. It does not have to be a large building with professional staff. Leading Lights Network exists to help you do extraordinary things for God. Gather a few people in your home and use the free Leading Lights resources to help you disciple and reach your friends for Jesus. We have sermons and teachings, practical advice and the stories project that will help you communicate the gospel in story form. We also have a prayer team and experienced church leaders who want to stand with you and develop your potential in Christ. We would love to partner with you to see God's kingdom come in your area of the world. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com or download the Leading Lights app from any app store.